and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember this information, it's strictly for your ears only. And I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Cam, what on earth are we doing this week? We are taking on Fritz Lang's 1944 World War II espionage thriller, Ministry of Fear. Perhaps the most metal-sounding movie we've tackled so far. It's a hell of a title, isn't it? Pretty good. Have we had a more metal-sounding title that we've covered on this podcast? Um, Nothing's really popping to mind that I can think of. I mean, of. some people might be shouting at us about the Jumpin' Jack Flash and the Rolling Stones connection. Eh, that's not metal. That's more like rock. That's true. I, although, to ruin your metal image of the name, um, for the last week... I keep confusing the title of this film with Mull of Kintyre by uh, Paul McCartney and Wings. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know why. I just kept confounding it in my head. And I, I, I even Googled it earlier, like Mull of Kintyre uh, stills. Oh, wait, no. Ministry of Fear stills. <laughs> I did not have that confusion going on in my head. <laughs> I mean, that song is still in my head now, actually. Do you even know it? No, no, I don't. I think the only... The only uh, Paul McCartney and Wings song I know is Live and Let Die. Which uh, which we'll get to one day. We will indeed. Um, but yeah, I, I had no idea about this film coming into this. I have a Fritz Lang story, which I might save for a little bit. But uh, yeah, had you any connections to this film before? No, I knew of it. I have a list hanging on my fridge that uh, I keep of movies on my watch list. And I think I'm on like, you know, version seven or eight of this list, but Ministry of Fear is on it. And so it's one that kind of was on the periphery of things I would watch. They didn't have a copy at my local library. Um, so it just hadn't really come across, you know, on my plate yet to actually watch. And when this podcast was launched and I saw that it applied, I added it to our list and thought, one day? We're going to watch it, and I'll have a reason to really seek it out and watch it. And here we are. <laughs> is, is this list right next to your copy of Little Drummer Girl? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's like propping up a table. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Nicholas Meyer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, I am curious. Maybe it is a good time to kind of dive into the question. Because we don't have any sort of background with this movie, what was your experiences with Fritz Lang? Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, when I was in university, I, I joined the Science Fiction Society at the university. Was that the swinging place to be? Well, it it, <laughs> it it was, apparently. I don't know why I joined, to be honest with you, because I, I, I don't know what I was getting out of it. And the first two meetings I went to, which happened to be my last two meetings as well, proved this point. The first one was at the pub and no one spoke to anyone. Uh -huh. So that, that, that goes to show you a lot about sci-fi nerds. The second was they did a showing of Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Oh, okay. Which is, you know, a, a, quite a long science fiction film. It's a silent film, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it. It's probably one of Fritz Lang's most popular works, I would say. Um, but they, they showed this film in an auditorium with the wooden seats in the university. Hmm. So I had to sit there for two and a half hours on these wooden chairs without any toilet breaks. So the film just kept playing and I had the worst time. Right. I genuinely didn't like that film because of the experience. This does not sound like a party. It was not a party. And I, I subsequently never went back, which is a shame. I'm curious, was the password to the secret group Klaatu uh, Barada Niktu? What's that from? <laughs> the day the earth stood still. <laughs> That's a classic oh. sci-fi thing. That's the um the words that stopped uh, Gort the android. That's the big dude that walks out of the flying saucer, right? The big silver dude. Yeah, yeah. Did, didn't didn't Keanu Reeves play him in a remake? Um, he played. Well, no, he played the human-looking um the guy who controls Gort in the remake, and that character is also in the original. So they didn't get Keanu Reeves to say those lines. Oh, he does say the lines. Yeah, it's the but he didn't play the giant robot. Is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. 
Well, we're, we're spiraling away from Fritz Lang here at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, my background with Fritz Lang was I'd seen Metropolis, uh, which I really was into. I was able to watch it on a comfortable couch, not a hard wooden bench. Um, and I really fell in love with the imagery. I mean, anyone who loves sci-fi, you know, whether it's Blade Runner, Star Wars, Star Trek, it all goes back to Metropolis. You can see the visuals in Metropolis carried into pretty much all science fiction. It's a really uh, pretty profound work in its influence. Um, the other movie I saw was M, which is um, with Peter Lorre. And it's about the effect a child predator has on a small town. And it delves into themes of justice and whether vigilantism is something that should be used or what the moral ramifications of it are. It's also a fantastic movie. And actually just recently, uh, you know, maybe a year ago or so, I guess with the pandemic, yeah, it was over a little over a year. I watched um, Scarlet Street at my parents' house. And um, that was actually a really enjoyable film noir. So I've liked everything he's done, but I also feel like he's one of my more underexplored famous directors. I need to dive more deeper into his uh, German films because I, I, I've seen, you know, Scarlet Street, but I haven't seen a lot of his American, but I, I've heard his Americans pale somewhat in comparison to his German films, and I haven't seen enough of them to have a strong opinion other than the two that everyone bandies about, you know, M and Metropolis as masterpieces. I mean, I don't know. And to be fair, this is my second Fritz Lang film. Does M and Metropolis, are they part of his sort of German period or his American period? Yeah, German period. They're both, yeah, right. silent films made in Germany. So they're all pre-World War II films? Yeah. Right, okay. Because I actually did a little bit of research about this director, so I, I'm not completely in the dark for once, which is nice. Mm -hmm. But um, right. I, I think we should skip on over to the letterboxd.com synopsis. Sounds like a party. <laughs> uh, Cam's favorite title, Ministry of Fear. Thrilling drama of the invisible network of terror. Stephen Neal is released into World War II England after two years in an asylum, but it doesn't seem so sane outside either. On his way back to London to rejoin civilization, he stumbles across a murderous spy ring and doesn't quite know to whom to turn. That's a pretty good synopsis. I feel like they may be... I really like that one. Yeah, I think they may have copied that off the back of a you know Blu-ray edition or something because it seems a little too well written for some of these letterboxed synopses. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like someone's just sort of uh, just filled the page in, basically. Some some yeah. admin. Yeah, um, it, it doesn't involve like a thorough explanation as to which fortune teller is which, which so many of them really delve into the details a little too much. And also, it kind of stops basically five minutes into the film yeah which i like mm -hmm. i don't I, I mean there's no cake mentioned which i'm disappointed about that's true uh but uh well okay you, you've heard my fritz lang story but i want to hear a bit more about fritz lang as a director so what have you got for me okay so yeah fritz lang was an austrian born director worked in german films for quite a long time now he came over to Hollywood in the 30s. He claims he was offered the position of the head of the main German film studio, UFA, uh, by propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels in 1934. And that was sort of a warning sign to him. He was a half Jewish man, I should say, uh, to maybe get the heck out of Dodge. And he said he went to France for a while and then Hollywood. The truth is a little muddier. Um, actually, on the Criterion Blu-ray, they talk about this was sort of the accepted version of this story, but he really spent a lot more time hopping back and forth and around than the um, well-established narrative would indicate. Uh, this doesn't surprise me. It seems a little, it seems like a really good anecdote to put into, you know, press articles. You'd agree? Uh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, one of the little bits of research I did was finding out that he had a German portion of his career in a an American portion, because you've got to think about, and you know, not to t jump into this film too much, but it deals with things like Nazism. Mm -hmm. And Big time. You know, this is a, a German director doing anti-Nazi propaganda films for the Americans. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a pretty big thing for 1944. Yeah, for sure. And I would also have to wonder if that was an intentional thing on his part too, because you know, if you're working in Hollywood in 1944 and you're from Austria. Um, maybe you want to make that movie just to 
take away any suspicion that some people might have about you. So at wartime, things are pretty pretty ugly, and I it wouldn't shock me if that was a little bit of the intention behind the movie. Well, I mean, we we deal with spy movies all the time, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was being spied on. No, that wouldn't shock me at all. No, yeah, but and, and yeah, you're right. It just sort of. Uh... I suppose producing propaganda films for the uh, the Americans would do a little bit to sort of clearing your potential name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, the the film was based on a Graham Greene uh, novel at the time. The novel was published in 1943, so the rights were snapped up pretty quickly. And Graham Greene is one of those authors I've never read. I don't think anything he's done, but he was someone who was a bit of a fixture at the time. And a lot of his novels were adapted into movies. He often wrote screenplays for them as well. Some of those books that were turned into films were um, The Third Man, which was like the most famous one to probably come out of that, out of that whole um, collection of stories. Uh, I believe he also co-wrote the screenplay for that one. Um, also The Quiet American, which has been, been made a couple times, including a Michael Caine version a handful of years ago. And also Our Man in Havana, which was another spy film. Uh, so Graham Greene, pretty well-established guy. And yep, the, the book for this film was very different. Uh, it seems like it was much more of a mood piece, much more delving into the psychology of its characters. And uh, the screenwriter for this film, uh, Seton I. Miller, came on board. And he was an Oscar winner for the 1941 film, Here Comes Mr. Jordan. Um, and here comes Mr. Jordan, I should say, was actually a movie that was remade as Heaven Can Wait and then remade again as Down to Earth with Chris Frock. So here comes Mr. Jordan, may not ring a bell, but a lot of people have seen various versions of that movie. Anyways, uh, Miller was the first guy to really crack that story. I'm curious, have you seen any of those three films, Scott? What was the Chris Rock one? Down to Earth. Maybe. What's the like the broad strokes of it? Yeah, so he is a guy who dies at a fairly young age and is sent back to Earth in another body. And it's an older man, I think, in all three cases, I think. It doesn't ring any bells, but I could see it being more of a comedy than anything else. Yeah, it's a comedy. And the 1978 version with Warren Beatty was a really big hit and Best Picture nominee and what have you. And the Chris Rock one? Not a Best Picture nominee. (laughs) Okay, sorry, Chris Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so Seton I. Miller came on board to write this, and he was a really well-established guy. He's written some great stuff. He co-wrote the original Scarface, The Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. He did The Seahawk with Errol Flynn. He also actually, curiously, one of his last credits, if not his last one, was Pete's Dragon, the uh, Disney film from the 70s. So Miller was a pretty well-established writer, And he also had an associate producer credit on this film. And so he had a lot of power over this production. And Fritz Lang, not a guy who likes to have any sort of oversight. So, um, yeah, not maybe the best of combinations. But one of the more interesting things was that because the book was much more contemplative, uh, much more character-based and psychology-based, Miller wasn't super interested in doing that. And more or less stripped it down to its bare parts in terms of taking the concept, the ideas, and making more of a genre exercise with it, which Graham Greene was not particularly happy with, but also isn't particularly shocking either for a 1940s film. It sounds like kind of a Paul Greengrass, Tony Gilroy bashing of heads then. Yes, it was, because um, (laughs) Fritz Lang and Seton Miller did not get along on set. This was an ongoing clash that Fritz Lang was not happy, particularly with the screenplay, but was not allowed to rewrite it because Miller was the associate producer. And so he was preventing Fritz Lang from doing any rewrites on this film. Well, hang on then. So why was he doing the film if he didn't like the script? I don't know. That's an excellent question. I could find... It's it's interesting to me that Fritz Lang, a very well-studied director and has several films that are very important. Not a lot has really been covered in terms of this movie. Even on the Criterion Blu-ray, the only feature is a 17-minute interview with a film critic talking about the movie. It's one that 
a lot of the details behind the making of it have been kind of lo- like lost in time, it seems. See, that just seems bizarre to me. Like, I don't know where the name Fritz Lang is at that point in 1944. He's obviously made Metropolis an M, so I guess he's made his best work already. Well, I mean, yeah, he's made Hangman Must Die the year before this. Um, he, he was someone who was working a lot in Hollywood, so he was not a fading name by any stretch of the imagination. It just surprises me that um, this, this, this Seton I. Miller gentleman, you know, he, he's obviously adapted the book, which we, we've seen happen at, at the Tony Gilroy of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, for Fritz to not be able to do anything about it seems a bit strange that he would just take it. Yeah, because he was a guy who always uh, rebuffed authority. And so you wonder why he would have signed on. Maybe they got along great off the bat. And then when it came to the actual production, that's where things got ugly. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, that's the best I can come up with because, yeah, he was not happy about not being able to rewrite the script. And this film did take some major um, shifts away from the book. So in the book, like the protagonist um, is more complicit in the murder of his wife. Uh, There's a whole amnesia subplot and a Nazi-run institution. There's a lot of other elements we'll talk about as we go into the actual breakdown of the movie. But again, it was a much heavier story than I think the movie was interested in being, which, I mean, we'll talk about the movie on its own terms, but it seems like there was definitely a shift in terms of the intent of the story versus the intent of the film. Well, another question I have, you may already be queuing up the answer, is if this was made for the American propaganda machine, um maybe they just wanted a fluffy film probably like i don't know that um audiences wanted heavy subject matter in 1944 i mean everyone knows the nazis are the bad guys you haven't really got much to establish that beyond you know a swastika Mm -hmm. um so maybe they, they just want people to have you know popcorn films yeah i would think so and they don't want any sort of ambiguity as well about sides probably I'm pretty sure that uh, reminds me of another film that we have covered, although it's not it's not coming to my mind right now. It'll probably come to me later. That where there was a you know, an opposing force that was portrayed in the film, and they had to be careful about how they portrayed it because of politics. Right. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me. One that jumps to mind for me is Notorious, where you had the um claude rain's character was a nazi and that movie comes out the year after world war ii so it's 1946 so it feels like maybe there's a little more room to i guess delve into the psychology of that character versus like during wartime it just probably would have been quite inappropriate was it also not billion dollar brain with the colonel stock character being kind of a good guy it probably was because you're right. Like that's the 1960s. That's kind of Cold War period. And Stock is teaming up with Harry Palmer. Yeah, it's probably one of those two. But yeah, again, so that sort of, it, it must be tough to make films and walk that line, definitely. Yeah. So a couple uh, casting notes. Originally, this was intended to be a vehicle for Alan Ladd, who not, I, I feel like of the era, Alan Ladd's name hasn't Um, stuck around the way some of the other big stars of that era have. But Alan Ladd, probably best known for playing the lead character in Shane, the iconic Western, but he instead enlisted in the army. So he was out. (laughs) A few other people that were um, considered for this film or attached. Rita Johnson was was originally cast as Mrs. Belaine number two, the uh, real fortune teller, as opposed to the one at the start of the film. She had to drop out due due to an illness. Um, as well. Now, Scott, maybe you can um, touch on this one. English comedian Constance Little was signed to sing in the film, but didn't. Of course, Constance Little. It's, uh, you know, everyone, I've got a little picture of them, you know, right in front of me on my wall. You've got like her 45s, right? Absolutely. Uh, I literally was spitting them right before I came on here. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't even know what's the dance of the forties. <laughs> what, what what what's the like the dance that people do at that point? Uh, are, are we waltzing? I, <laughs> are we jitterbugging? I, I don't think know. it's jitterbugging. I think jitterbugging is like the fifties or sixties or something. <laughs> uh, I'm doing I'm doing the twist to her records right now. Uh, that's fifties. <laughs> so I don't know what we're doing in the forties. Um, but needless I don't know, to man, say, boy, ninety seven. <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> Constance Little was a well-known comedian, but I'm guessing her um, comedy stylings aren't alive and well in Britain today. 
Uh, no, I have absolutely no idea who that is. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so the budget for this movie was 700000 It went over budget, 44000 So uh, that's a bit of a cost. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. some of the um, friction between the writer and uh, you know Fritz Lang probably didn't help matters. And uh, yeah, so this thing went a little over. It was not a hit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, I could not find a hard number for what this movie earned, but in every sort of ranking from this year, it ranked, you know, around the forties, fifties, that sort of thing. And I feel like in 1944, the world had better things to do than, than to track the specific dollar earnings of the movies ranking at like number 40 and 50 on their box office two hundreds of the year. Wait, wait, what, what you say? There wasn't a bunch of 30 or 40 year old nerds talking about films in the 40s too? <laughs> well, I mean, there might have been, but uh, mm. I don't think they were focusing as much. I think they had other things on their plate in 1944. <laughs> I, yeah, I can imagine they were a bit busy. Um, I was actually really interested to hear about the uh, the money that this film made because I wondered what the box office was like during the war. Who was going to the cinema? Yeah, I mean, people were going. Um, obviously, a lot of the population is out of commission. They're out, you know, at in battle or serving in some way in the war effort. So um, movies did do well. It's just that, you know, if you look at movie productions coming out in The Warriors, there's fewer movies coming out. And a lot of them are more like escapist things, like universal horror movies are coming out, things like that, that they can kind of shoot quick and easy on the back lot. Uh, there was some notable movies, though, of this year for the top three of the year. Number one was Going My Way, which I believe won the best picture as well as the best actor. Bing Crosby's the star of that one. It's sort of a very upbeat, um, optimistic story of a hip young priest who comes into like a Catholic school and really turns it around. It's a pretty enjoyable, fun movie. And completely the opposite of the dark themes of say this film or what was going on in wartime aren't you just talking about sister act (laughs) i mean movies like sister act probably do follow in the lineage of going my way for sure okay i I might have to check it out because i really like sister act so yeah and going my way did spawn a sequel called the bells of saint mary's as well so it was very successful uh number two was meet me in saint louis which is a really beautiful looking musical with Judy Garland, amazing technicolor images in that film. And number three was Since You Went Away with Claudette Colbert. That was also a Best Picture nominee from that year. And it is about the women left behind while all the men went to war and just trying to go about normalcy in day-to-day life in civilization. So interesting movie. I don't think it's as strong as some of the ones that came post-World War II, like the best years of our lives in dealing with um, sort of the war experience for people at home. But uh, Since You Went Away is pretty solid. One other thing that's interesting to note, though, about this year at the box office was that um, this movie, um, while I don't have a hard box office figure, seemed to earn just, it was like right around the same placement on the box office for Alfred Hitchcock's Lifeboat, which was a bit of a disappointment for Hitchcock at that point. And Lifeboat made $1 million from what I could track. So my guess is this movie made around that number somewhere. But you said the budget was like 40000 No, no, the budget was 700000 They went 44000 over budget. Oh, okay. Well, well, it still made a profit, surely. It probably did fine. It probably broke even at least. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Maybe they were looking for a bit more in those days. I don't know. These days, I think studios would be lucky to get their money back sometimes sure i mean going my way was uh making plenty of money (laughs) in comparison to its budget whereas this one was a can it get across the line sort of thing i mean it's probably something i want to tackle later on but um i I don't know if the appetite is there for dark dingy spy stories in 1944 right um so just kind of some uh final notes on this film Fritz Lang said he always felt the screenplay was beneath him and he was never happy with the finished product. In a 1967 interview with Peter Bogdanovich, he said he'd actually fallen asleep watching it on TV. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Again, why did he do it? I don't understand. 
He also later apologized to Graham Greene for um, not adapting the novel well enough. So, jeez. Yeah, like Fritz Lang really carried this one on his shoulders. It's like, dude, people don't hate this movie. Like, this movie has, um, you know, a fair amount of fanfare around it. Like, jeez. But, you know, it's one of those things. Sometimes you hear creators talk about things in very, like, negative terms. And you're like, uh, okay, I guess. Like, I don't know. People really liked it. See, that's the thing. Because you, there's a lot of creators out there that would make you know films or songs or whatever and they hate to see their own stuff or watch their own stuff but the reaction to it usually pushes them over the line of okay it's probably fine um and to think that this film got like a criterion remaster i would have thought there was a fan base there definitely is so i think it's just a case of maybe the circumstances behind the scenes were so unpleasant for him that he just carries that into the experience of watching it and just can could never remove himself from that that's quite possible yeah, I could say so. I, I, I didn't read up on what the book was like, although it sounds like you've got some of that information. So I'll be interested to hear that from you later on as well. Mm-hmm. Because if it's that far away, why would you, you know, why would you apologize to the, the writer? Yeah, just uh, a lot of people unhappy with this one, I guess. Uh, a yeah, couple other okay. notes I'll make. Uh, Fritz Lang followed it up the exact same year he put out in 1944, the movie Woman in the Window with Edward G. Robinson. That movie was much more successful uh, also, Ray Milland, the star of this movie, would win the Oscar for Best Actor the following year for Billy Wilder's The Lost Weekend, which is one of the really, really great films about alcoholism. So I would recommend that. And we'll talk more about Milland going forward. But that about sums up the, uh, the experience of what was Ministry of Fear during production and box office. Well, I guess it's time to tackle the film. So the lights will fade now. Did you get a laugh out of you? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so I, no, I was waiting for a follow-up line. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, I, I it, for me, I, I've said this before. When I'm talking about older films, I always, I, I'm not really that down with older films. I don't really know how to how to interpret them. Sometimes, I, I, I think I've been fed popcorn films from the '80s and '90s for so long. It's, it's sometimes tough for me to really to to, to get into these films. Mm -hmm. So I I think my second viewing was quite important in actually getting an opinion on this film. I have a question. Do you find there's some sort of dividing line in the eras of movies we've covered? Because we've pretty much at this point tackled everything from the 30s to modern times. Do you find there's kind of a sort of decade dividing line somewhere? Like, is it sort of 60s onward is more acceptable or where does it fall? I, I think I find anything from the 80s onwards easier to watch. Mm-hmm. Then again, I fell asleep with the Bourne Legacy, but I think also anything from the '60s onwards, just I don't know, uh, the color always just seems more vibrant. Everything just seems a bit more lively. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas looking back on our '40s, uh, '50s entries, I mean, uh, it's hard to say uh, North by Northwest isn't lively. Yeah, that's also one that just technologically feels somewhat ahead of its time too. Like it feels very still quite electric nowadays. Yeah, so but then I, our, our oldest film was was Matahari. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah, right. And, and this feels a lot. Uh, uh, this feels quite connected to that film, I would say. Mm-hmm. But in terms of my initial thoughts about it, I I thought it was a very cute film. Um, it had some fun moments to it. I didn't dislike anything about it, nor did I gain much from it. Mm-hmm. It was perfectly watchable at uh, 90 minutes. Right. But I, 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 I've I, got criticisms and I've got some likes. I think I have probably more criticisms though. Uh, what, what did you think? So I enjoyed the film, but I, I found, I think it's very hard for Fritz Lang to make a movie I don't find engaging on some level because his visuals are so incredible that mm-hmm. a lot of the time I'm just so sucked in by what I'm seeing. I mean, even just the opening shot of this movie of, Ray Milland watching the pendulum of a clock. I was like, this is beautiful. This looks like something you could frame and put on a wall. But I think for me, this has a spy plot, you know, not unlike something you'd see in one of the more, well, like the 39 Steps, for example, one of the more kind of, um, you know, uh, lighter, shorter, um, kind of speedy Hitchcock capers. Mm -hmm. But it has, to me, like some issues in that, I, there's a lot of 
kind of psychological material going on throughout this story that I didn't feel we were really delving into because when we first meet Ray Milan's character, he's coming out of an asylum. And this movie never really introduces a lot of questions as to whether this spy plot is a figment of his imagination. Um, it, it pretty much settles that very quickly. And so I was kind of confused as to what the sort of analysis of this movie was. I was enjoying the journey. I was enjoying some of the set pieces and some of the, you know, the twists and what have you. But at the same time, it felt like a movie that while I would say it's good, it's held back from greatness because as much as I appreciate the mood, that World War II setting, and I want to talk more about that going forward, it, it was just lacking a little bit to kind of chew on when it was over. When I watched Notorious, that's a movie that also has a ton of atmosphere, but it feels like when it's over, I can really, I mean, we talked on that episode about the characters and why they're doing what they're doing and what makes them complex and interesting. Whereas like the characters in this film feel much simpler and more driven by the plot. And I found that to me was what held it back a lot of the time. Yeah, I think that's probably, I mean, that is one of the criticisms I've got written down uh, if, if we're starting off here is that it, it wants to take these uh, these big stories. You know, like he, uh, our main character, uh, Stephen Neal, assisted in the suicide of his wife. Mm -hmm. And that's why he ends up in the insane asylum. Now that's a big old, that's a, that's a, that's quite a meaty bit of uh, character work to chomp into there. And, you know, some some hard-hitting story, but they don't really do anything with it. Well, no, they don't, because as I said, like in the book, he actually took part in the suicide of his wife. Um, and so it was like, a, you know, a, he is feeling like a murderer throughout the story. Whereas here we find out he went to get the poison. He was going to help, you know, kill his wife because she had become very ill and it was going to be basically assisted suicide, but he couldn't do it. And so he put the poison away and she found it and took it of her own volition. That removes a certain amount of responsibility from the character that in the book would have really carried with him, I think, throughout that story. Whereas here you get that one kind of monologue where he, breaks all this down to the female lead um carla played by marjorie reynolds but it doesn't feel like it lingers going forward and it doesn't feel like a guy who's really suffering coming out of that asylum i i mean to, to sort of tag onto that and pivot into one of my problems with it is it's the tone of the film yeah it just seems to be all over the place I just feel like you've got moments where so he's he has that great shot at the beginning, like you said, where he's sitting in the asylum, he's counting down the seconds until he is released. And that's a great opener. And then he immediately goes to a town fate where he's walking around, giving shillings to people, making quips and jokes. You know, his wife died two years ago. I mean, I'm not saying you have to be a sad sack walking around, but I don't know. If, if he wants to play the card later on, which he does, about him being so sad that his wife died, he can't be cheerful skipping around in a, a village fate. Well, here's the question. Is he actually that happy or is he putting on a happy face? Like he's been locked up for two years. He wants to engage with life again and he's doing his best to, to do that. I, I wasn't 100% sure if he actually was super cheerful in that moment. The The reason I th I take it as he is is because if you if you skip... I don't know, 10 minutes forward. So by this time, he's taken a train into London. It's gone past the cake stuff, which we'll get into, which in itself is is hilarious. Yeah. Um, he's then meeting up with a private detective in central London who is walking around with the most enormous cigarette I've ever seen in my life. He <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like a cartoon character. And he's, he's doing the old, like, you know, one for me, one for you, one more for me with the whiskey and stuff. It's, it's a caricature. Yeah. And so I don't know if it wants to be serious or not it's not fish or fowl right i will say if i was um spending two years in an asylum watching the pendulum of a clock every day i would probably enjoy a trip to the carnival too <laughs> that's true i mean would you would you take the cake or would you have uh, exchanged it back that uh would i take the cake I don't think I would care enough about that cake because yeah I mean this whole bit about having to give the exact weight of a cake to win it it's a fun little gimmick and I liked how it ties into the fortune teller there who gives him the exact answer and that's how we kick off our spy plot again 
it's goofy, but I liked it because it's the sort of thing that I go, I mean, I've never seen that in a movie before. <laughs> I've never seen a cake leading to a Nazi spiring. But <laughs> that's a connection right there, isn't it? It is. But if I had like a very stern looking guy being like, give me the cake, give me the cake, I'd be like, okay, what do I care? I don't, what am I going to do with a whole cake? <laughs> I don't want to be back in prison again. I just got out. I mean, he takes this whole cake. He's like sitting in a train eating it with his hands. <laughs> I, I can't, I couldn't, I mean, it's an off, off topic thing, I suppose, but I couldn't figure out what he cut it with. I think it was pre cut. No, no, he's chopping it in the scene. Is he using like a pen or something? Oh, anyway. oh, maybe he had like a pen knife or something. Sure. A, a strange thing. But uh, to be fair, and to give you a little bit of context, because you're always asking about England, Cam. So I thought, uh, let me give you some, some England context. We do have a lot of village fates here. And you will find things like, guess the weight of the cake. Guess the weight of this courgette. Oh. Have you yeah. taken part in have you taken part in these contests? Yeah. Have you ever won? Nope. Oh, okay. I'm I'm it's not one of my many many skills, uh, unfortunately. I'm not good at guessing the weights of courgettes. <laughs> Wait, what's a courgette? <laughs> what do you mean what's a courgette? Oh, do you mean like oh we do you mean like corset like flowers? No. Oh, what's a courgette then? It's a vegetable. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with this. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Cam, a courgette is a zucchini. Oh, okay. I know what a zucchini is. Great. <laughs> Do you know what a courgette is? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I have to add, if you're asking me whether I would care if I won a zucchini by guessing the weight, no, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> we need to give it back. Okay, can I have my pound back? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this may be the greatest thing I learned today is that a courgette is a, a zucchini. <laughs> Neither of these things fe uh, feature in the film. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, to, to tag back in, it, it's, it's a, again, another one of these examples of the film being a bit ridiculous, which is, is fine if it is just a ridiculous spy caper. You know, it, it's got that whole Hitchcock thing of the wrong man in the wrong place. Yeah, it definitely feels very... Hitchcock in terms of its setup and basic concept like it like I said it feels like the 39 steps or north by northwest and I like that they set up this espionage plot with some like real color to the situation and also it's done very succinctly you don't really have the sort of convoluted backflips you sometimes have to do in these spy films to introduce your spy plot and I thought it had some real atmosphere I kind of like the cheeriness of this fair and then when he wins the cake and is walking out, I love how the soundtrack goes dead silent. Yeah. I thought that was really, really effective. Like Fritz Lang is really, really good at atmosphere. You see it in that pendulum scene. And I think you really feel it here where he's just like walking through a silent fair, which is really unnerving. Well, because it starts off when you walk into the fair and there's kids running around screaming, playing. There's a there's an atmosphere to it. But as soon yeah. as he gets the right uh, cake weight and he picks up the cake everyone just turns on a dime and it reminds me of the scene i think it's in the first matrix film okay when when like everyone becomes agent smith simultaneously in i think morpheus is showing neo the matrix because he has the man with the red dress or something like that but they all turn around and look at him at the same time or it might have been inception actually oh okay uh well, everyone looks at maybe uh oh yeah yeah um I know exactly the scene you're talking about, and now I'm conflating Inception with The Matrix. It's in, it's either in one or the other, but it's definitely the first Matrix or Inception. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, listeners can let us know, but it's one of those two films, but they, everyone just turns and just looks, and there's that kind of like, it's that tension. That It's the whole like when you're standing up in class and everyone's looking at you waiting for you to say something. It's really stressful. Yeah, and off this setup, I was like convinced like this is going to be really fantastic because I'm loving this setup, like going from the moodiness of the beginning to kind of catching you off guard with this cake story. I was like, this is really cool. And I was with it. Like even when he's sitting on the train, eating the cake with the blind man and you get that tension of this guy who's clearly not blind and is, you know, looking at him whenever um, Raymond has his, you know, vision cast aside or has his head, you know, back turned or something like that. 
I thought all this stuff was really tense and there was some great atmosphere. And uh, you know, as a viewer, that something's going on here at this point. Mm -hmm. like, you can tell that there's a setup, but our character of Steven hasn't really figured out something's going on. So when you have this uh, fake blind man in the train trying to get this cake back, um, and, and you can see that he's not actually blind because when Stephen Neal looks away, he then looks at the cake and, and such. There's, a, there's, again, a real tension in the air. And then that scene where, um, you know, they uh, get off the train and the blind man's running away and uh, you're like running through this really like foggy looking swamp that's really like beautiful looking and you've got bombings going on. It's really great filmmaking. And again, the first like 20 minutes had me convinced I was watching a masterpiece. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think a lot of my problems come the second we get to the private detective's office. Yeah. Well, that's that's when things get convoluted. Like the setup is really beautifully achieved. And it's when we actually have to deal with the convolutions of the spy plot that things get a lot muddier and I think a little less visually dynamic. It's kind of effortless how they introduce us to the world and you get the whole cake and everything. And, and, and as you say, they just sort of dilute it from there on in. Yeah, and you think about it, Fritz Lang begins in silent films. And you could play like the first 20 minutes of this movie all in silence, and it would still be just as effective. So you can see his command of visuals is very, very strong. Well, okay, so we've both gotten to the point of, uh, I'm not going to recount the whole story, but, yeah, you know, I didn't like where it went after that point because I, I feel like it just it lost the tension and became more of a farce. Because then you get like the scenes in the the charity building. I forget the name of the charity, which introduces us to the the love interest of the film, uh, uh, Carla and her brother Willie. You're talking about the Mothers of Free Nations Society, of course, which you are a proud member. Of course, yeah. Um, I, again, neither of them really sell me on who they are, or at least. I mean, Carla is who is who she says she is, but Willie is obviously pretending because he turns out to be one of the main antagonists of the film. Yeah, I mean, they feel very like chipper characters. I think it's interesting. You know, they both have uh, escaped from Austria, which is immediately going to kind of raise suspicions in your mind. Like, hmm, that's very curious. What could these two characters, uh, you know, how could they factor into this story? And I, I like the setup, but... I a lot of this is setting up a little bit of a romance between Carla and Steven, uh, which it's fine, but it also feels a little conventional in a movie that off the top felt kind of experimental in some of its imagery. Like it, it feels like the kind of thing you'd see in a lot of movies at this time. Well, you've you got to think your protagonist is coming out of a, an insane asylum yeah, where he's not claiming to be wrongfully imprisoned. He's, thanking them for their treatment and letting him go. So he's immediately being you know, portrayed as maybe not a bad guy, but a troubled person. Mm -hmm. He's not, he's not your white knight riding into town like a cowboy. Sure. Um, but after all this stuff in the, the charity, we do get probably my favorite scene of the whole film, which is the seance. Yes. Hell yes. This is again, a visually dynamic sequence, but what did you love about it? I, it the visuals, I would say. Um, I, I think it must it must go to Fritz Lang's work in in silent films, because with minimal uh, lighting, because it is they turn the lights off in the room, which is what I referenced earlier. Um, you've basically just got little bits of shadows on everyone's face, and they there's a voice in the background. It actually has a mood to it. It's a visually stunning scene, and it's probably the for me the most interesting scene in the whole film. It's really kind of unsettling. And you have this fortune teller played by Hilary Brooke, who plays uh, Mrs. Belaine. And the way that when the lights go off, she is completely like lit up in darkness. It's a really beautiful visual. That is another like hanging on the wall type of shot. And um, I, I really thought this, this uh, seance, in some ways it was almost too good. Because it set me up to really expect maybe a more psychologically interesting film than what I was going to get because you have during the seance these all these kind of 
mysterious figures here. You've got this guy, Cost, played by Dan Dorea, um, who is some sort of mysterious figure in all this. He's in the seance. You don't quite know what's going on. Everything's kind of eerily lit. And then you have a scene of Ray Milan and the pendulum clock. Like you see like um, uh, uh, what's it, superimposed on the screen. And you are starting to tie it back to the beginning of the film of him in the mental asylum. And you're having questions of, is this guy having a break from reality? And yet like the movie doesn't seem interested in whether the spy plot could actually be a, a figment of his imagination. And I found that really strange because it seemed like the sort of thing you would want to do. <laughs> it, it would make perfect sense. And it, it kind of tries to broad stroke past that because later on the inspector somewhat questions his mental state, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to. But one of the things I liked about the, the seance scene and playing into the whole spy story is that, that felt kind of like a, a game of clue mm, yeah you know, you've got a doctor and uh, there's a, a mystical person and all this stuff and the guy gets shot you know in the room with the wrench in the drawing room you know <laughs> that, how, how do you shoot someone with a wrench <laughs> clearly you're not trying hard enough yeah <laughs> um but yeah and that was interesting but then again as soon as it's done he's punching his friend and running away and Really, later on, you find out that the whole seance really didn't mean anything. Well, it is weird in that you have this apparent murder, but it never feels like there is any tension coming from this. Like, a Hitchcock movie would ratchet up the suspicion, the sense that this guy could be nailed at any second for this crime he didn't commit. Whereas here, I don't know, it seems pretty lackadaisical afterwards. They're like, okay, well, you know, that's not great, but uh, moving on. Well, it's it's interesting because, like, he says from the beginning he doesn't want to get messed up with the police again. He states that when he's leaving the asylum, which is kind of one of his driving forces through the film because the sensible person would report this to the police. Yeah. Um, But he doesn't want to get tangled with the police. I understand that. So then he runs away. But you you should really have the the police maybe turn up as soon as he runs out so you have, like, oh, they almost got him, that, that tension there. But he just kind of shrugs and leaves and he gets away no no problems i even think of the movie psycho where you have janet lay um thinking she's being followed by a police officer and you'll just have shots of the police officer looking in her direction with sunglasses and which mask his facial expression really but in her point of view this is someone who is watching her and she could be in trouble and you don't get that like you don't get ray milland feeling that paranoia of being potentially trapped in a deadly scenario and maybe that's just more of a fritz lang thing he's not as obsessed with point of view as hitchcock but it it feels weird in a what is supposed to be i think a fairly tense spy plot yeah and then he he bumps into what he thinks is one of the the nazis outside the office of the private investigator who goes missing Mm -hmm. which eventually turns out to be the police um, so you do get that kind of tension there, but I almost feel like it would have been better if that person had been in a police officer's uniform. Well, here's a question because yeah, you're talking about Inspector Prentice, played by Percy Warham or mm-hmm. Warham maybe. Um, now this character I thought was actually kind of interesting because he's introduced as uh, some sort of mysterious authority figure, but he's also you never have that turn of him seeming like a you know, I'm your ally now. Like he always seems very aloof. And I kind of like that in the movie that he's someone you could kind of project whatever you want onto, and he's not going to give you one thing or the other. Yeah. He, he, he probably is the only other person that stands out apart from Stephen Neal. His character is, is, is quite interesting in the sense of, I, I, I didn't know that the cops in the 1940s were so forgiving that they would let you uh, waltz off to find some cake. <laughs> I don't know that they actually were. Um, I'll, I'll yeah, promise like... you, Gov. Hang on. <laughs> there's some cake and there's pigeons fighting over it. I promise you. I feel like this movie's really good at establishing characters who just kind of have fairly slight material in the movie. Like they just kind of pop in and out. Like the inspector obviously is a really good example. But I also thought um, 
Mrs. Belaine, the the real fortune teller as well. Like there's a scene where her her and Steven are just like sitting on a couch and he's reaching behind her head to pull the gun out of her purse and she completely knows what he's doing the whole time. And I thought like scenes like that felt really electric, but it's it is more of these like supporting players who don't really factor into the plot very much. They kind of pop in and are very memorable. And I think we're getting to one of the things that I've gotten written down as a dislike is the villains don't feel memorable or imposing. Yeah, it, it feels like um, a movie of this era where the villains are Nazi spies with exclamation mark. And you're like, okay, like, what are they doing exactly? I don't know. I mean, they're apparently, um, you know, infiltrating the Ministry of Home Security, but like, what are they doing? Mm, not sure. There seems to be some sort of microfilm about landmine plans that are going to get passed around. But, um, okay, like, it doesn't feel like it's a very specific spy plot. It's more of the threat of a spy plot on home soil. No, and you find out later on that it's to do with uh, microfilm with, like, a minefield plan, I believe. Yeah. Uh, we, okay, fine. But... I never felt threatened by the Nazis. Well, you have the character of um, Forrester, who's the big suspect throughout, played by um, Alan Napier. And I don't know if uh, you caught this, Scott, but uh, Alan Napier played Alfred in the Adam West Batman show. Oh, did he? I did not know. I did not pick on that. I did not pick that at all. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of the movie is shifting who could potentially be the Nazi spy. And there is this character cost who does pop up throughout and is tied to it. I found in terms of him, he, he worked for me, but you also don't know anything about him just that he is a all in caps Nazi spy potentially. So I agree. Like it, it plays it fairly simplistic. I guess it's more about exposing the plot versus the actual villains But it would have been nice to have maybe a more memorable face on the villainy. Yeah, it just feels kind of like uh, like you're playing a game of whack-a-mole. It's one pops up and then it goes away. You you don't really have time to fear it. It just the next guy's popped up again, and then it goes back to the first guy. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they don't stick around to really be feared. And the other thing I had to say was, if they're Nazis, I would have thought you'd have a little bit more. I don't know, Nazism. Like there's no pontificating speech. You, there's there's one little swastika on the books. I don't know. I, I'm not. They are spies. They are meant to be undercover. I understand, but I just thought we might go to one of their houses and see that they've got the flag above their fireplace or something like that. Sure. Yeah. You have that book, the psychoanalysis of Nazidom, which is yeah. a very very on the nose book title. I wonder if that's a real book actually. But um, you yeah, it's. <sighs> I'm just wondering if they would have been wanting to pull back on Nazi imagery and too many strong illusions during wartime. Like, ultimately, they're trying to create an engrossing thriller for audiences, and maybe they don't want to pull them into the real world too much, maybe? I mean, that was sort of a question I posed to you earlier on, and also was going to get into it later, was if this is a propaganda film, what is the goal of a propaganda film? Well, it's to um, very much support, you know, uh, basically your your home country against your enemies. And I guess what it's doing is it's turning the Nazis into very simplistic villains that need to be stopped because they can do harm to us, which, I mean, propaganda wise works. Okay. Yeah, I I suppose I can see that. You, You don't need any more levels to it because that would give them, I suppose that would humanize them. Yeah, like that. a lot of what propaganda is, is about turning them into a they are an evil that must be stopped yeah therefore you know help do that with us and i mean i think this movie one of my favorite things about it is the sense of world war ii atmosphere it's something we haven't really come across in anything we've covered yet where throughout this movie there's bombings there's you know they have to like hole up in like um subway um stations and things like that i i really love that sense of impending doom throughout the whole movie but I wonder if some of, say, like delving into real Nazism or even darker aspects of the murder of his wife and things like that, if it just would have been too heavy with already, I mean, audiences are going to this movie and they're being reminded of bombings of London. 
it was interesting to see what we went through as a nation here during the war and you know things like the blitz and having to go into underground stations as a bunker because your house is about to get blown up you know it, it's it's crazy how we just sort of just got on with it and compared to what we're dealing with now and and everyone just moans about you know wearing a mask or whatever i don't really want to get into it too much but just like for god's sake your house could have been blown up at any point and people were like yeah okay i'll turn my lights out and go into an underground station no problem yeah i know and just the idea of him getting out of the asylum and being like i just want to go back to cities that are busy like i don't want to go out to the country or anything like that you know yeah it's like hello like there's bombs <laughs> but again it's you know what life goes on i want to get back to the city and the scene where he's on the train with the blind man and they're saying well you know they may bomb the uh you know the track at some point and you hear the planes overhead and there's a nearby munitions factory like that's all really unsettling stuff. And I just love how it's portrayed with like a sense of normalcy here where it's just like, yep, this is just our life. Mm -hmm. It's something I've, I don't know that I've seen a movie that's exploited that to the sort of effect that this movie has. It's, it's actually kind of crazy when you, when you point that out, because again, we found another thing that we like about the film. Yeah. From the, from the tension that's being built from the scenes like the seance to this impending doom of the blitz. And yet, it doesn't seem to hit home. This film is still missing its mark. And I, 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 I'm trying to figure out where it went wrong. I think for me, it falls into the actual following the actual spy plot as we have so many reversals and we have, you know, this uh, mysterious character of Travers being introduced. And it's like, okay, like at a certain point, it becomes less about soaking in atmosphere than basically in front of you filling out, you know, point by point. Wait, how did we get to here? How do we get to there? Who's involved now? Who's not involved? Who is actually this person using a different name? And it's like some of that stuff gets, uh, it doesn't feel as inspired as the mood and atmosphere of much of the movie. That's to me, I think, where I got a little not lost plot wise i heard people refer to this movie as confusing and i never felt as lost in it as i have in say a couple of the other spy films we've tackled but it felt like i was more just having to focus on connecting dots which wasn't as interesting to me as the atmosphere of the first half and then some of the sections we're talking about i i think i just struggled to connect with anyone right like it's like the, the world was there but the the characters were vacant Ray Milland as the lead. And I love Ray Milland. I mean, you see him in, you know, The Lost Weekend, which I referenced earlier, or Dial M for Murder. He's incredible in that as like a really sleazy husband who's um, plotting the death of his wife, Grace Kelly. Like he's great in that movie. But here, I found his character a bit blank. Like you don't get a lot out of him. And you kind of then want the supporting cast to boost it up. And there are these bit players that kind of pop in and out and kind of weave the movie together in interesting ways. But you are relying a lot on this Carla Hilfe character played by Marjorie Reynolds. And that was a character I just, again, I struggled with the relationship between these two. Again, it's the classic, I've known you for, you know, 20 minutes and now I'm in love with you and I want to marry you thing, which to me, it's a sort of thing that comes with old movies, but you need to buy the chemistry. And I didn't really buy the chemistry between these two. That is how we met. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> I, 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 of course, was professing my love for Cam, just for reference. But he kept just, just patting, batting me away. No, Scott. No, Scott. I was like, I'm going back to the asylum. See you later. Keep, keep your courgette away from me. <laughs> and I, I do wonder, part of the story, this this book that Graham Greene wrote was, you know, the scene where they track down Travers's apartment and it's this unused apartment that there's a bomb that they've been carrying that goes off? The, the Roger Thornhill apartment, basically, from North by Northwest. Exactly, yes. And that bomb goes off and Stephen Neal dives and, you know, saves Carla. Now, in the book, he had amnesia after that bomb attack and wound up in another institution that was actually being run by Nazis. And he had to basically um, gain his senses and learn that this was actually all an illusion and that Nazis were running this asylum. I think that maybe they didn't want to do that in the film, but I think you could maybe, boy, that would be a really interesting thing to do if in a you know remake scenario or something. See, I didn't know that about the ending. That That's a, a lot deeper. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I could see why they maybe wanted to stay away from it, but, um, and certainly you do get some bizarre choices instead, including the, the inspector taking him back to find the cake uh, and a shootout. And then the, the very, again, sort of melodramatic scene at the finale. I, I did love the inspector um, bringing Ray Milan's character to the, um, you know, the site of where the uh, blind man was blown up and then letting him dig through the crime scene. <laughs> yeah, just get your hands everywhere. It's fine. Get your, get your prints and everything. <laughs> Good stuff. Ray Milan's like, get out of the way. I'll do this. And he just starts digging out and pulling out pieces of evidence. It's like, well, okay. 1944 crime scenes, I guess. It's funny that he never looks like worn down or disheveled by anything. No, that's true. He doesn't, does he? Maybe that is of, of the time. You think about like, uh, I'm going back to Cary Grant in North by Northwest. Like he has to get his suit cleaned because of the Gus Cropper incident. Yeah. Like he, there is wear and tear on him, and he gets more and more exacerbated by the whole the the the, the spy plot as he goes along. Whereas uh, Stephen is made up and 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 well kept the entire time. Yeah, and you also don't get any sort of moments of like psychological cracking under the pressure of all this either. No, the closest you might get is the séance. That's maybe more to do with just the fear of the that instant when he's there. But. I also then wonder if this is more of a product of 1944 during wartime, wanting to to project a more strong image of, in this case, you know, a British leading man character. Keep calm and carry on. Yeah, you know, stiff upper lip and all that in wartime. Yeah, I could see it, but I I, I think that's probably where it, it falls down for me. Um, I I don't I think we've kind of gone through all of the major characters. But um, I'll pr- just quickly run through them in case we have any notes. Mm. And then I guess we'll just go for any other things in the film. But in terms of Ray Milan's performance, I've not seen him in the films you've referenced. This is my only experience of him. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think he... He doesn't do anything for me, unfortunately. He, he's a charming, handsome man. Uh, he, but apart from that, I don't, I don't really get that sense of dread that he should have. Yeah, and, you know, we referenced it earlier, and he has that monologue about his wife. And I feel like that should be, like, a shattering revelation for this character. And it it isn't really, and it doesn't lead anywhere particularly deep. Apparently, in the ending of the novel, um, you know, he, he does take off with Carl at the end, like in this. But it's much less optimistic. It's more that he feels like he is still going to be um, you know, exposed as a murderer the rest of his life. She feels that she could be exposed as a spy. And so it's these two people kind of going on the run in fear. And, you know, they don't know what the future could hold. Kind of like the ending of Blade Runner in some ways, depending on which cut you watch, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but okay. yeah, but the movie, boy, the ending of this movie is bad. Like it's full on bad, right? It. I, I was scratching my head at that choice. Like the shootout, I can just about deal with. The shootout is actually pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the driving down that sort of, I don't know, was it like a, a cliff or something? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And and then the, the cake joke. Yeah. Where he just goes, cake, cake. <laughs> that, that's, that's my ending line. That's gone now, but uh, totally worth it. It's putting a button on this movie that's like very simplistic in we can argue about whether it has the depth of the novel or not. I don't, I don't think it does, but it also feels like a movie that's a little thornier and a little, um, uh, a little more complex than just putting a button on the end. That's just like, Oh my God, not another cake. You, you think about the ending of uh, three days of the condor. Yeah. Robert Redford's character is talking to Faye Dunaway's character. And she says, you're probably not going to be alive for much longer. And you believe it, and he believes it, and you know that they're they're basically messed up. Yeah. Uh, there's no there's no cake joke. Again, like I just go back to I wonder if they just wanted, and I don't know if this was studio interference. I don't know, um, but you can't help but wonder if in a 1944 audience they want to give them that happily ever after ending where it's like everything's gonna be okay. They made it out. They stopped the spiring. They're going to be, you know, married and happy forever after the end. I suppose from that perspective, I get it. And it actually maybe delivers as a propaganda film. Mm -hmm. But as a spy story, I think it's where it's having trouble. 
Yeah, because there's some complexity, too, to that final moment where you have Raymond in that shootout, which I thought was another really well done sequence where they turn off the lights so mm-hmm. you can't actually see the guys in the doorway. Again, very tense, very simple concept, but really well done. And then you have the light go on and you have the inspector kill them all and just walk up the stairs. But there's never a moment of the inspector walking out and saying to like Stephen, well, you know, all's well that ends well. It's like it just cuts silently. And so you never really know who this inspector guy is as a human being. That is feels very ominous and kind of still has some tension to it. And then it cuts to cake. <laughs> Raggy. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if you have a, a good impression, but it, it did sound like the Porky Pig ending of Looney Tunes. It did. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that button that you didn't need. Uh I, I don't know. I, okay. I mean, we'll just go through the rest of the characters before we do anything else. But um, uh, Carl Esmond, who plays uh, Willie Hilfe, which is Carla, the love interest brother, who I think turns out to be the main, or well, one of the main bad guys. Yeah. I can see, again, I'm getting confused who really the main bad guy is, but let's, let's say it's him. Willie's character is dispatched by Carla, his sister. And that was something I, I realized as we were about to record. Because you're telling me that this is the ending is different from the book. Mm-hmm. Does she still kill him in the book? She does not. He commits suicide. Okay. So I was wondering if it was like a choice so they could make Carla and Steven's character both having killed someone they love. I do think that's a big part of it, yes. I think they want to parallel those two characters. Yeah. That I could see that's maybe why they made the choice, and it's a lot cleaner and far less depressing if uh, if she kills him as, a, as opposed to suicide. Because the connection between the two of them, if she doesn't do that, is that they're both on the run feeling exposed, you know, for their past, you know, whether it's mistakes or decisions, I should say. Maybe decisions is the better term. But um, if you remove that from her then um and you make her much more of a very clear heroine character you lose that connection so having her kill the brother reestablishes a connection between the two of them and it's just different it's that they both you know killed a loved one so i guess it works in that level and i actually thought the moment where she shot him was actually kind of surprising and really well shot <laughs> pardon the pun <laughs> it looked like a it was a really nice visual of the hole in the door appearing the light coming through the door yeah um but in terms of like Carl, uh, Carl Esmond's character being a villain, he's fine, but he's such a like non-character. I mean, I enjoyed him earlier on when he just seems really enthusiastic and he's like, oh, you know, knock me out. And he's just like so happy to take part in Ray Milan's, you know, little scheme. But when he's revealed to be a villain, I'm like, well, I don't know. He still seems pretty cheerful and happy. Like he, I don't get any sort of menace from this character. It also doesn't hold up to repeat viewings in a sense, because as you know, I do two viewings of these films and going back and knowing that the ending, you question why he even chose to help Steven in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he really, he caused his own destruction. Yes. Well, <laughs> the classic Nazi spy rings are always uh, engineering their own destruction by involving outsiders. What a goof. I would also point out maybe they didn't have him kill himself because literally the scene before the the heavy of the film, uh, the the guy who shot during the seance supposedly uh, kills himself with a pair of scissors. Yeah, and Ray Milan scissors connection. You have a murder with scissors in Dialogue for Murder, and you have a murder with scissors, or I guess a suicide by scissors in this film. So Ray Milan, when he pops up, hide your scissors, people. Sounds like it. Um, yeah, I suppose there's what, two suicides in this film then. Um, the wife of Stephen Neal's character can be counted. Yeah, yeah. So then there would be three with the brothers, and maybe they were just trying to tone down the the heaviness for again it being a propaganda film. Possibly, and I thought the you know the cost slash Travers the Taylor character, effective visual. Like he's not a character with a personality. He doesn't really talk that much at all. Uh, but I thought that scene in the you know the clothing store at the end using the mirror, the big mirror on the wall was pretty effective and kind of threw off your sense of geography because you're basically taking in the events of the scene through the mirror versus an actual shot of what Raymond is seeing. I thought that was kind of disorienting in a good way. And uh, 
that scene was well done. But he's again, it's like Cost is not a character that I could care about. Like when I think about Martin Landau's heavy in North by Northwest, like I'm really satisfied at the end when he's up there on Mount Rushmore chasing, you know, Cary Grant. Like that's really effective stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Cost, I go, okay, well, that's a memorable end, but he's not like a, let me put it this way. You know, a year or so, or however many years from now, when we do our list of like spy villains or something, he's probably not going to pop to the forefront of my mind. No, I think he'll be down on the bottom somewhere. You don't even technically see his end. It's behind a closed door and you just get the open reveal. But I imagine the whole the code at the time wouldn't allow any of that sort of thing. Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, uh, we've already spoken about the inspector. Uh, I guess the only person which we briefly mentioned is uh, Alan Napier as the uh, the Nazi doctor. Yeah. Um, again, he was like barely in it. Yeah, he's a character that there's a lot of mystery built up around, but okay. Like, he's a figure of the plot. Um, and some of the characters who are figures of the plot, like the fortune teller, have a lot of personality, but this guy, not really. Not really. Um, okay, any sort of final tidbits to mention any notes you've got? Um, one thing I will just uh, uh, bring up that I actually thought was also effective was just adding to the atmosphere of the movie was you had that scene, you know, in the, when they're down in the subway station and like the train pulls up and it has the sign that says something like, um, careful about what you say. It may leak information to the enemy. Little touches like that. I thought were really effective in establishing the sort of paranoia of world war two London. Like it's, it, it's kind of really soaked all throughout this movie. And, I think that's why I find this movie still, despite our issues with the spy plot, I found it quite involving and quite interesting to watch, even if I wasn't like, you know, kind of on the edge of my seat and thinking this was a masterpiece. See, I I noticed some of the, I definitely noticed that train sign and some of the other sort of background work and the prop work and like the, the sets and everything, I think were really well done. And I'm wondering if this is more to do with what we spoke about earlier with Fritz Lang not being happy with the script. So he presents a very visually interesting film. Mm-hmm. You've got the seance scene. You've got the, the watching the clock at the beginning. Uh, maybe not the cake scene at the end, but you, you know. Uh, whereas anything to do with the interplay between the characters, it just seems to be dead on arrival. Well, like he is an amazing visual stylist. So I have to believe when he's going through the script and he's going to be putting a lot of time and effort into the moments that mean something to him and the moments that don't, maybe he's just kind of like, uh, okay, <laughs> frame it and shoot it. But I'm really, really into this chase through a swamp. I'm going to make that look like a million bucks. I, I, I can't really argue the fact that this film looks great. No, it, it really does. It's pretty beautiful. And the criterion restoration is something to behold. I mean, I I also watched the Criterion version, and yeah, it's stunning. Yeah, and uh, to think it came out in 1944, it's terrific. But the characters for me just they they felt so two dimensional, and the interplay wasn't there. They just felt like, uh, like uh, I don't know, caricatures of people, and they didn't know how to talk to each other, and they were interchangeable at times. I I, I don't I don't even think I blame the actors particularly. I, I just think it was the screenplay. Yeah, I mean, it just didn't, I don't think, have an interest in its characters in the way that others would. This feels to me, though, like for Fritz Lang, you know, he's someone who comes from German Expressionism, which is that heavy use of shadows that would be applied to film noir movies. This feels like an earlier example of the film noir stories we would get, like The Third Man, actually, which Graham Greene wrote. Uh, We'd get that like five years later. This feels like it's setting up that sort of that use of shadow and mystery and uh, it just doesn't quite have the character ambiguity you would get in those movies. Like in a real film noir, you have a lot more questions about the perception of reality that Ray Milan's character has. Yeah, and I think they kind of try and look at that in broad strokes, but never really laser in on that. And I think that it could have been an interesting way to go with this film. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I had two notes. The okay. first one was, did you pick up on the fact that there might have been a scene missing? 
Okay. Uh, I mean, is this in terms of connecting all the dots to the spy plot? Because uh, I can believe it. Which scene are you talking about? Well, I, I'm sure there are some scenes missing for that. And I'm sure the book fills it in much better. But uh, when he gets off the train in London, which you don't see, you just see him sort of getting back on the train after the bomb explosion. Mm-hmm. Uh, he then goes to see the private detective that I mentioned earlier with the, uh, the comical... A cigarette. He talks about having his apartment turned over. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Which you never saw. Yeah. I wonder if that was not shot or what. It's curious. Um, I guess I maybe it was a scene that they shot that wasn't that interesting and they said, you know what, just have him tell the inspector this because that covers the ground anyway. Yeah, I, it, it just jumped out to me that the if you're going to just do ADR lines, maybe just don't mention the house at all. Yeah, I mean, we should say, this is a very short movie. It's 87 minutes. So I could believe there may have been a scene or two cut along the way, none of which which uh, wound up on the Criterion Blu-ray. Hmm. Okay. And the other thing I had noted down was this film did genuinely surprise me a couple of times. I don't know if you might have saw through it quicker than I did, but I had no idea about the bomb in the suitcase. No, that also caught me by surprise, too. Like, this movie isn't ultra predictable. And that's something that we've tackled other movies that we saw, you know, the villain reveal coming from a mile away. This one actually did a pretty decent job in keeping me kind of in the dark throughout. Yeah, and I also didn't see the the brother twist. No, um, I thought there was a better chance she was actually going to be involved. Yeah, after her disappearance at the in the bomb room. Bingo. Yeah, that's exactly how I thought it was going to go down as well. But then it turns out that it's the brother. But the actual bomb going off, I made a note of it going, it just reminded me of like the, I don't think, any, again, anyone's ever made this comparison, but the the twist in Cloak and Dagger with, with the fingers. <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> A comparison, the most famous of comparisons. Fritz Lang and whoever the hell directed Cloak and Dagger. <laughs> Auteurs, men of their time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, we we'd like to apologize to Richard Franklin right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would. Um, yeah, I, it, it genuinely surprised me, and I was I actually had like a, a verbal reaction to it the first time. I was like, oh wow, I did not see that coming. Like he physically throws her across the room. It's a very physical scene. I quite enjoyed that. It it kind of woke me up a little bit. I watched this movie quite late at night last night. And I was a little concerned, like, oh, am I starting this too late? Is it going to be a little draggy? But I felt it, it was quite energetic and it kept me going throughout. So I, I appreciated that. Like, it didn't feel, despite the issues, uh, you know, kind of tied to the production and what have you, it didn't feel like a movie that had been basically turned into oatmeal. Because I've seen those movies, the ones with terrible production issues where you watch the movie and it's all just like a flat line. This one does feel like it has a pace. Yeah, I, I think it uh, it deserves its length. It shouldn't be any longer. And I think 90 minutes is a nice place to end it. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I, I didn't struggle with my two watches. <laughs> Which was the toughest one to make yourself rewatch? See, Men in Black 2 had kind of like a comical value to it, like how bad it was. And also just like, what can I, you know, make notes about to make fun of sort of thing? Exactly. How, how many non sequiturs can I find? Um, Men in Black International was tough. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. And I, I mean, there was there was one set of films I didn't rewatch. The TV movies, the Harry Potter yeah, films? I, I couldn't. I, I will never watch those again. That's, that's pretty set in stone. Yeah. Uh, what about you? Well, I only watched them the once, but of the movies that I have rewatched for the podcast, International was by far the toughest one to sit down to actually rewatch. Yeah, I could definitely see it. It's all those uh, CGI Paris scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I think I've, I've covered everything. Cam, have you got anything else? No, I think I'm covered too. Okay. So does Ministry of Fear make the knock list? Cam? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm, I've am i added some other Fritz Lang movies to our list to cover in the future. I hope we get a Fritz Lang film on the actual knock list. But to me, this one, 
it, it feels like a movie that's kind of at crossroads where I love so much of what it's doing, but it feels like a lot of the other instincts working against it are kind of corrupting maybe what a pure Fritz Lang vision would be. But it is a movie I recommend people watch. I think people are going to enjoy it or at least appreciate a lot of what it's doing. It's just that when we're looking at the knock list, I feel like most of these movies are pretty pure visions and I don't, think this one is this feels a little more compromised yeah i could see that i i think what you told me in the beginning definitely rung true of my experiences of the film i just don't know that i feel good about a movie on the knock list that has like an ending as tone deaf as cake like it just feels so just ah, like it's it feels almost like hollywood meddling where you have a woman kill her brother and in the next scene is laughing over cake like it's just it feels like a movie that's got some things working against it. Yeah, I I would agree. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna labor the point. It's a it's a no from me as well. I think the bare bones of the story has got something interesting there. I just think the screenplay, the restrictions, obviously we spoke about earlier, it doesn't it just doesn't deliver. I I am not interested in any of these characters by the end of the film. I think it has some outlandish scenes that pull away from what it's trying to be quite serious at times. Um, And I don't think you can have your cake and eat it. (laughs) But I will say, I think we both like it more than Fritz Lang does. Yeah, actually, yeah, I would say that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, if if you came around my house for some strange reason, because you live in Canada, um, and said, hey, let's watch Ministry of Fear, I'd be like, hey, why are you in my house? And then <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd be like, okay. The fact he says he like fell asleep watching it on TV, I'm like, really? Like I would, I mean, I guess if you make it, it's very different than the experience of me watching it. But nonetheless, I'm like, I can think of a lot of other movies I'd fall asleep in before this one. Yeah, it, it's it's punchy it, it it's 90 minutes long it doesn't feel longer than that and it, it it's enough yeah and you've got some actors doing interesting things yeah some interesting things i don't think anyone's really working to their potential yeah but yeah it's a it's a no for the knock list i hope we do find a uh a fritz lang down the road that makes it in because i think from what i've seen so far he's a very interesting director and i'd like to see some more um i just don't think this was the right spy story for him yep i, th- I think i can agree with that Well, there we go, folks. It looks like Fritz Lang is not taking the cake this week. Uh, Ministry (laughs) of Fear is not making the knock list. But before we discuss what we're doing next week, we have a special message from another friend of the show. What's up, Hushlings? I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. We're joined by our protege, Slick Frank Sanders. Frank Sanders here. How's it going, Hushlings? Join us Mondays for the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour as we take new initiates through the dark secrets, hidden truths of the underbelly of the conspiratorial world. Each season finale ending with a live show. Follow along on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And listen on all streaming platforms at our link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Hush Hush Society. Remember, the best kept secrets are hidden in plain sight. Well, there you go, folks. You know we love to keep things hush hush here as we are spies. So that is the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. That's right. And they did an episode on the real life men in black at the start of this year. So check them out for your conspiracy needs. And who knows, maybe they will touch on, you know, Nazi spirings in ways more elaborate and in-depth than what Ministry of Fear did. And maybe they mentioned Vern Troyer as well. <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> uh, well, Cam, what are we doing next week? Well, we're really uh, taking a change of pace. We are jumping to the year 2000 to take on the first Charlie's Angels film directed by McG and starring Drew Barrymore, Cameron Diaz, and Lucy Liu. Is it McG? Yeah. I've never said it How would you pronounce it? I've just never said it out loud. I've never tried. It's one of those ones I don't want to mispronounce. Muck? Yeah, it's McG. Yeah, McG. Because his name is like McGinty, and he shortens it to McG. Well, all my ladies, can you hear me? Throw your hands up at me. That's right.
So there you go, ladies. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is watch Charlie's Angels from the year 2000 and join us next week. Uh, you can, of course, find our knock list at letterbox.com slash spyhards. And don't forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, remember... You can't charge people with being Nazis just because they belong to a charity.